ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 101. And I can't believe I'm saying that. I can't believe we reached 101. I did not think we were going to reach one, let alone 101. Uh, to, before we introduce tonight's special uh, veteran uh, actress and iconic one, you know, also, I would also like to introduce uh, tonight's co-host for this evening, home movie fan and also Dr. Katz fan, Mr. Christopher Patty. Hey, yo. It's good to see you again, Chris. Good to be here. Likewise, buddy. Uh, now to introduce tonight's special guest star, let me just say that this is one woman you will never win in a court, especially science court. She is also a well-known actress, uh, director, and theater uh, actress as well. She's known for projects known uh, for the Tom Snyder slash Soup to Nuts company uh, projects such as Home Movie, Dr. Katz, Science Court, and Hey Moni. And she's Probably one of the most multi-talented actors I've ever seen in my life. My guess at this time is the iconic and charismatic Miss Paula Plum. Paula, welcome to the show. How are you today? Thank you, Peter. I'm great. It's really wonderful to be here. And it's amazing that you know so much about my cartoon career. Oh, let me just say you're one of the best. Like growing up, like whether, whether it was Science Court on uh, ABC's One Saturday Morning or also because my science teacher in the middle school used to play science course for us for both the, uh, I think it was a living environment and also uh, physical science. Yes, yeah, we covered everything. Absolutely, and before we get into those questions though, I wanna ask the typical cliche question and that is, how and when did you get your first big break into acting? Take us there. Um, well, I created my own break for myself when I was in sixth grade. I was 11 years old and I went to Catholic school and the nuns, <laughs> I was, I was bitten by the, the, the acting bug. And I, I'd, I'd seen Mary Poppins about a million times with Julie Andrews and I was determined to be an actor. So at age 11, I convinced the nuns to let me script scenes from plays instead of writing book reports. And then I would cast myself in the lead and my friends in the supporting roles and we'd travel around the schools to play our scenes because the nuns were so fascinated that one of their students could do this. <laughs> I should have become a like television writer, you know, but I became an actor. Damn good one too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Chris, you and, a and then in terms of a break, I mean, you know, there's no, I mean, really, you know, a big moment in my life was doing mermaids. I mean, that was 1989, 1990. And uh, um, it was a huge event in my life to be part of that production. Very cool. And yeah. Chris, before you ask your next question, uh, you did mention the uh, 1990s mermaid movie. Do you want to talk about some of the memories you may have had uh, working on that as Mrs. Uh, Crane? Well, you know, it was with Cher, as you know, and um, when Cher would arrive on set, it was like, it was like the Pope was coming and the, everything shut down. She's coming, she's coming, she's coming. It was on all the walkie talkies. Everybody had to be quiet. Cher was arriving. You know, it was, it, and it was my first experience with someone who was famous. Um, the other people in the movie, like Bob Hoskins, were totally charming and accessible, but Cher was very much the star of the show and you did not speak to Cher but um but she was very talented and very good it was it was fun working with her I really loved working with Winona Ryder this was I think her first big movie Christina Ricci they were both adorable so I had a blast and I'm still getting checks for mermaids almost 30 something years later great nice. <laughs> yeah great success <laughs> um Christopher you had a question uh, any methods or preparations you do for the role or a role? Um, it depends on what I'm what what part it, I'm playing. You know, like I did a play uh, a year ago about an uh, an epidemic. Actually, it was called the Children, and I had to learn a a dialect that was Northern Ireland. And um, I used Fiona Hill from the uh, Trump investigations as my sort of spirit animal. She has a very broad North country accent. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of preparation I do if I have a role that requires dialect. Otherwise I try to read what the playwright has done, other plays. I try to, you know, research what 
people have said about the play that I'm going to do, you know, critical reviews and that sort of thing. So I get a deeper understanding of what the play is about. Oh, oh okay. okay. Uh, and I have to ask you this too, because I ask all my uh, guest stars that are actors and actresses out there, and this is the raw emotion question. Now, I'm going to put you in a scenario, uh, uh, Miss Plum, where like if you were doing a scene with a fellow co-star, and this scene is a it requires that you and the co-star to get into this heated confrontation as part of a scene, and yeah. your co-star comes up to you and say, "Hey, uh, Miss, hey, Miss Plum, I had an idea." Uh, like, and in order to do good storytelling and also to make it like much more believable uh, to the audience at home, I had an idea. Like, it may, like this scene requires us to get into this heated altercation. Now, I know this is gonna sound very weird of me to say, but I, I think you should like lambast me, lambast me, and lay into me so hard that you can make me flush, uh, like, could make me cry in frustration. Now, if you were approached with this type of method, what would your reaction be to that method, and what would you tell that particular co-star? Well. <laughs> I would actually never expect another actor to suggest to me what I did in a scene. Um, the, the, the kind of emotion you're talking about is something that comes when you get into the work and you start rehearsing and you have a moment to really find out what the two characters are, are doing. The, what what is the action? I mean, is my action to castigate you, to make you feel small, to embarrass you, to shame you? Great. Let's go for that in the scene. But usually actors don't don't approach each other and say, I think you should do this. Um, it's kind of a cardinal rule to leave it up to the director. So at the end of the day, he has the final say. The director or she. Or he or she, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Or, she or the they, final, or they, or it. <laughs> it has the final say. <laughs> they have the final say. <laughs> they, I mean, there's um, no real it. It's like either he, she, they, them. All right. Um, I also had a question in related to voice acting because you have done a lot of voice acting pro uh, projects, and this is uh, one I was I asked all my voice actor guest stars, uh, mm -hmm. and that is. Uh, there was an episode of The Simpsons where on uh, auto commentary where they said that Kirk Douglas hated doing a scene voice acting using headphones because it hurt his ears. Now, in voice acting, do you, do you prefer wearing headphones or no headphones during voiceover work? Oh, I totally prefer wearing headphones. And I'll tell you why. When you have cans on, you can reduce the performance aspect of your work and get much more intimate into the scene because you can hear your voice and it softens everything and you understand it just makes it a lot more delicate and real being able to hear yourself and for commercial work it's, it's unbelievably much better um you just, the feedback it's not true of acting in a scene like acting in a movie but acting in a voice in voiceover work, it's totally useful. I agree. Like if I were to do voiceover work, I would want to have one ear covered and the other one out so that way I can hear what the director's saying and then what uh, the exact line is supposed to be. Right, right, right. Um, now, in addition to doing voiceover work and live action work, you've also done TV specials, which is going to lead to Chris's next question. Chris? Uh, yeah. Do sorry. Yeah. So, uh, what was your like, or what are your memories of doing in Dick and Polly's uh, celebrity special, or Dick and Polly's oh. special? Sorry. Well, my husband played Dick, and actually, I'm going to just show you. We have the the cartoon on the wall over here. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, let me see. Let's see. Um, it's. Can you see the the two characters? Oh yeah, the characters. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway, we had, it was insane. It was my first opportunity to, I mean, I did, um, I did science court and that was a very, you know, lucrative little gig. But when we did Dick and Paula, it went into a whole other level because we had managers and people were going to put it on FX. And it was, it was one of the most, I was getting paid so much money to sit there and laugh, seriously. <laughs> I would just go into the booth and I was with like John Benjamin, um, Paula Poundstone. Um, you know, we had, uh, oh, this guy named John Leopold 
who um, was insane. He wrote for Cheers. Um, it was... It, you know who John Benjamin is, right? He's H. Like H. H. John Benjamin. It, he did the bus show, the show about the bus. Can't remember the name of it. I my mind. Anyway, John Benjamin is a brilliant actor. Now he lives in New York. He's a comic. Um, he played uh, a million characters on Science Court and on Home Movies and on Doctor Cat's Professional Therapist. Anyway, um, we would just be on the floor laughing for four hours. Seriously. Um, and, and they did this thing called retro scripting. So there was no script, right? It was complete improv. They would just give us an idea and we go into the booth and sit down and go. And then they would go back and edit it down to like 23 minutes and create the cartoon from our improv. Usually you get the cartoon and the script, it's all done ahead of time, and you just read the script and make it work. This was the reverse of that. We made it up, they did the cartoon after the fact. So yeah. it was a new a new way to work. I, I have to mention too, because you mentioned Science Court, and that's what I wanna talk about again uh, with you like here tonight, uh, especially memories of working on Science Court, working with the cast, because you had like an all-star cast. I mean, Fred Stoller as the stenographer Fred. You had Paula Poundstone as Judge Paula. You had um, H. John Benjamin, like you said, and he's also on Bob's Burger now. Um, that's so that's right. That's right. And he's Bob's also doing Burger. Archer. He's on Archer, too, and Family Guy. Um, and also, I believe on the show you had, I could be wrong on this, too, but was Brent, was Brendan Small on the show? Yes, Science Court, and um, oh God, who? Yes, I'm I'm trying to remember all the names. I can't. What uh, the guy who played my my adversary? Yes, um, uh, Doug, the guy's name is Doug Savage. I'm trying to remember what the voice actor's name was. Yeah. Um, Let me. I'm actually gonna look him up. I can see his face in front of me right now. I haven't talked to him in years, but I'm gonna um, I'm gonna see right now. I'm gonna look it up and see what the guy's name was uh, that played him. But yeah, uh, it was such a great show. And I think this was also by Squiggle Vision, right? Uh, yes. So it was initially called Science Court, but the uh, Bill Baratis. Bill Baratis. That's what it is. Bill Baratis. Yeah. It was initially called Science Court, but they wanted something sort of zippier and more kid-like. So they renamed the show Squiggle Vision. And because of the way the cartoons were made, we had the uh, outline of the characters was always kind of vibrating and shaking. So they called it Squiggle Vision. Yeah, and then I think years later, like I think in the third, second, or I think it was the second season of Home Movie, they stopped from Squiggle Vision and they went all flash animation. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, but the, yeah, I remember our family guy actually making a joke in their cutaway gags about the animation of Dr. Katz. And Peter's like, uh, what's going on with you there? Uh, he says, oh, I believe I have a seizure. Or something like that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said John Leopold. It's Tom Leopold, who is a, a comedy writer who wrote for Cheers. He was on Dick and Paula. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Dick, uh, uh, Tom Leopold, John Benjamin, me, my husband Richard, and a million different guests. We had Wanda Sykes. We had... You know, a lot of very famous. We had Andy Kauf, not Andy Kaufman. Um, oh, I'm terrible with names. I'll have, I'll think of it. <laughs> um, with, with Science Court too, like, and this is probably just going to be me with my inner six year old and middle school year old asking you this question. But can you still do the uh, do the Allison Kreppel voice? Well, it was it was I mean, it was my voice, and they just sort of altered it a little bit. You know, if you close your eyes, you'll hear Allison. <laughs> Did you, and also, did they name Allison Krempel? Is that like an inspiration for the Honeymooners? Because it sounds a lot like Al, uh, Alice Krempton. Yes, I don't know. I, you know, Tom Snyder created th this idea. He's like this genius guy. And he came up with all the Doug Savage and, <laughs> you know, crazy names. Um, but the weirdest thing was when I did Dick and Paula, I they made, no, what was it? It, was, it wasn't Dick and Paula. It was another... So it was another cartoon that it was the first cartoon that never happened. And they, the cartoonists had never seen me. They just created a, a 
a cartoon picture of what they thought I looked like. And it was this, in, I mean, incredibly sexy woman. <laughs> this was the first thing. And then it was funny because then they'd come up and they they realized that, you know, I'm just me. And they um, they came up and they, they would make uh, little idiosyncratic parts of the character um, visual in the cartoon. Like I had this habit of writing on my hand. So Alison Krempel would always like write notes on her hand. And it was just kind of like, they. Just, and I, I never said anything. They just watched it and put it into the cartoon. You know, it was sort of fun. Cool. And But did you have a favorite Science Court episode? There was one about worm castings that was sort of interesting because we were talking, pardon me for saying this, we were talking about poop the whole time because worms <laughs> eat and then they, they create fertile soil. And it was just, I just remember it as being particularly hilarious in the booth. For me, it would be the ones I saw like when I was a kid, like uh, during one Saturday morning uh, on ABC and also one I saw in middle school. One of them was living things. And that was the first time I found out that is the chicken bone dead, living, or non-living? Or I thought it was non-living until the correct answer was dead. Right. Which I had yeah. no idea. Like, yeah. it, but, and also my first one, I believe is the first episode I saw with uh, Science Course with you, and that was Water Cycle. A water cycle. That, you know, it's, it's been how many years? I haven't thought about these things for a really long time. I, I have them all. You know, and you can you can go online and find them on on YouTube. Yeah, have and, to go back. And also, another episode I love that, that that you were in though it was I think it had to do with like heat expansion and where like this big me like big metal falls on this superhero guy, which I think was voiced by the same guy I had on my show. Uh, he's actually because uh, the first person I had uh, that was on Squiggle Vision and Tom Snyder production was Ron Lynch. You know, oh yeah, Ron Lynch. Yeah. Got, I got him on my show, and I think he actually voiced the uh, the guy that was being honored that was suing the woman that Paul that that your character Alice uh, Alice was was, was represented. Yes, that's right. But yeah, like um, that was also another great episode. Like, I, I just I've been trying like so hard to get like people that were part of the Tom Snyder company, like yourself, um, Bill Baratis, uh, Ron Lynch, Sam Sater. Emo Phillips is another one. Like mm -hmm. I've been trying so hard. And like you're the second person I've had from that era of like squiggle vision slash soup to nuts. There were a lot of really great people. Um should try to get Tom Leopold. He is a scream. Okay. He improvised with Harry Shear of um the Simpsons. No, he Harry Shear did Spinal Tap. The um Spinal Tap. Yeah. And they did this they would call each other up and these are this is all private stuff it's never been um you know publicly released um and they um what was it L lola della femina there was a character that tom leopold made up and he would play this woman and harry shearer would interview him and it was the craziest stuff and we would listen and just laugh you know these people they they get bored and they have to like you know call each other up and improvise if they're not working <laughs> <laughs> uh chris yeah. you said you had a question right yes of course uh so oh. what are your memories of working on dr cats one of my favorite shows um well, Jonathan Katz, as you know, is a genius. Yeah, he his jokes. He you know he's got a he's got a podcast now. Um, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, it just came out. Um, but I just remember Jonathan Katz and his dry sense of humor. <laughs> um, and also he um, he needs a wheelchair. And he had a, um, he'd come buzzing in. He had an electric wheelchair that was like a little car. And he would come zipping into the studio <laughs> and scare everybody. And I mean, he's just, he's a delightful human being. And and a, a, a really generous, kind person, but also very, very funny. You know, his jokes, We, my husband and I, <laughs> 
we we this is this is one of our favorites every morning i get up and i ask my co- my my wife how she likes her coffee it's a small thing but it's annoying <laughs> <laughs> did you have a favorite episode that you did i don't i think i only did one episode of dr cats oh um but but jonathan was on science court and he also did um dick and paula okay so he was around a lot Oh, I got a question for this next one, though. And it's another one of my favorite works you did. If I had to give my top three favorite uh, works that you've done, uh, Mrs. Plum, it would definitely be uh, No Particular Order, Home Movies, Dr. Katz, Science Court. But this uh-huh. next one, memories of working on Home Movies as Mrs. Peabody, and of course, uh, Trudy Neely, a.k.a. Fenton's mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think John Benjamin was the one who was Fenton, right? Uh, no, Sam, um, Sam, Sam Sater. Sam Sater was. Oh, Sam Sater. Yeah, John Benjamin was the voice of Coach McGurk. Coach McGurk. That's right. Sam Sater, who is now like, I mean, a, another major famous human being. Um, yeah. I see him on Letterman and I don't know. He's just, he's, well, David Letterman's gone now, but I mean, uh, he's just been around for a really long time, but now very well known. He's also a political yes. uh, pundit, isn't he? Yeah. He, he has a political uh, podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And he's another one I'm actually in talks with to coming on the show in May. I spoke yeah. to his, uh, I spoke to his agent. So like yeah, looks, some of these like, people, you got to go through agents. I have no problem doing that. Yeah. Like, if I get turned down, I understand, but you know what? It's all part of the game. Um, you know, I I think I also only did one or two episodes of home movies. Um, it I could have done more. I don't have as vivid a memory of doing those as I do of Dick and Paula because home movies was scripted and Dick and Paula and Science Court was sort of scripted, um, but uh, Dick and Paula was totally improvised. So I feel a certain, we were also credited, Richard, my husband and I, with being co-creators of Dick and Paula because it was us making it up, you know, so that was kind of nice. And with the character that you you portrayed on home movies, there's a total contrast of what you portrayed in Science Court where where Alison Krempel is is a strong-willed and strong-hearted and strong-minded person, while Trudy Muley is more submissive towards her son, especially in the first episode. Like, he bullies not only every kid around, especially Brendan Small, but he also, you know, manipulates and, you know, you know gaslights his mother, too. Yeah, he, he's a little brat. <laughs> he, he is. That's why, Chris, you remember the scene, right, from home movies during Fenton's party when he was yelling at her mom and then Coach McGurk screamed, like, unmercifully at him and forced yes. him to apologize. I thought that was such a feel-good moment. Yeah, Tom, um, John Benjamin... <laughs> could take it to 10 do you know what i mean he could go to 10 in a second <laughs> he's we really good. Mm-hmm. and yeah. uh we also want to get your thoughts on another show you worked on chris uh memories of working on the tv show uh, hey mooney or hey mooney hey mooney um you you know guys it's been 30 years what was the character that i played on hey mooney this is your question. You have 10 seconds. 10. Ah, <laughs> I, I, just know, I just know you were on it. I don't know the particular character. Yeah, no, I don't. I, I, I don't. I actually don't remember what the character's name was on Hey Moni. I will look that up. <laughs> okay. I, and I don't have, as I said, the two shows that stand out in my mind, obviously, are Science Court and Dick and Paula. The others I kind of made appearances on but I wasn't an integral part of the ongoing series. No, so would you say that all the appearances you've done, pro- like aside from those you just mentioned, was just cameos? Uh, in those, in those that you, yeah, in Hey Moni and uh, Dr. Katz, Professional Therapist, they were, they were more cameos, yes. I saw on your website that it said Hey Moni on it. That's also another way I, I did my research. I... <laughs> I'll have to go look at my website. But I do want to talk about, like, you know, and 
and Chris, before you ask your next question, because it's going to actually lead to the next uh, to Chris's question, and that is, we want to talk about some of your theater work. Like, what were some of your favorite works? Like, I've seen you done many projects, such as Happy Days and Lady Macbeth as the main title of the character. So, like, did you have a particular favorite play, like theater work you've done? Well, you just named two of my favorites: um, oh. Winnie and Beckett's Happy Days and Lady Macbeth in Macbeth. But also I did, um, in 2017, I did um, Martha and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. And that was kind of a groundbreaking experience for me. I could only do that play once um, because it's a real emotional workout. Um, but it was ex extraordinary. I had a brilliant cast and um, a brilliant director, Scott Edmiston. I had the perfect scene partner, the guy who played my husband, George, his name's Steve Barkheimer, um, was just a beautiful experience, even though it's a desperately dark play. I, you've probably seen the movie with Liz Taylor and Richard Burton. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I've seen bits of it, though. I didn't yeah. see the whole thing. I've seen it, like, in clips. Mm -hmm. But um, Happy Days was is almost a one-person show. Um, I uh, It's... Um, 80 pages of one character speaking the whole time while she's buried in a mound of sand, dirt. And then Willie, her husband, is off to the side. He has 80 words in two hours, and I speak for the rest of the time. Um, it was, it's a, it's, Beckett is a very, um, it's like Scotch. You have to acquire a taste for it. <laughs> uh, uh, now, may I ask to uh, Mrs. Plum, like, if there was any, uh, uh, theater production that you always want to be part of what would it be there's a play that I still I could still play you know as you get older you age out of roles like I'll never play Juliet unless somebody does some sort of concept version of it um but there's a play called The Visit by Doran Mott he's a oh god I want to say it a German play um I could be wrong. It could be Scandinavian. Um, but it's a play about a woman who is exiled from a town as a young girl. You don't see that part, but she comes back and um, as a very wealthy older woman and forces the town to make a decision. She will give them millions and millions of dollars if they agree to kill the mayor. So it's a very, it's a very, um, it's a dark play, but it's it's really great. It's a great story. It's brilliant writing. Yeah. Um, Chris, you had uh, another question, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. So, which do you prefer, acting, theater, or directing? Primarily, I'm an actor. It's what I prefer. I like to play. Being an actor is like being a child. You can just go and you know, do what, what you will um, and create. Being a director requires much more of your left brain, uh, your, I'm trying to think, left brain, yes, your executive function. And uh, there's a lot of organizing. There's a lot of people management. There's a lot of interpretation. There's a lot of scheduling. There's all sorts of things that, you know, go into directing. Um, also being able to, uh, serve the play and the playwright. Um, so I, I do prefer acting, but I do I direct quite a lot. In fact, my my gigs this year, and I know you're you're about to ask me what's next. Um, I'm directing two plays this summer. Both of them are are all women. The first one is um, a play called Love Loss and What I Wore. It's about clothing and memory, and we're doing it at a, at a um, a gay bar in Boston, Club Cafe. And using, I think we'll be using drag queens in the show. Um, and then the second play is a play called POTUS, President of the United States by Selena Fillinger. And it's, um, it was on Broadway last year. Um, and there's a subtitle and I'm going to get it wrong, but it's uh, POTUS or how it takes, or, or, oh gosh, I have to. Wait a minute. I will give you the right sub. I will give you the right title in a second. Okay. Um, but it it it's uh it's a play about seven women in the White House trying to keep a Trump-like president <clears throat> from 
destroying the country, <laughs> basically. Um, yeah, but okay, here it is. HOTUS, or behind every great dumbass, are seven women trying to keep him alive. <laughs> <laughs> I, lo I love this, the brief synopsis. Yeah. Um, now, before we ask the, uh, but you just said the, the what's next question, um, I do want to ask, and this is another running gag we ha have on our show, and that is, whenever I'm not on a strict military-like diet, I am an absolute foodie. And I know you worked on a lot of production companies, uh, Mrs. Plum, so I was just curious to know, oh, uh, which was your favorite production uh, catering scene in which production company, and did you have a particular favorite meal in catering? Okay, mermaids, hands down. Final day of mermaids. Cher had lobster tails from South Africa flown in, and we had lobster tails as the as our last um, craft services. They call it craft services, right? <clears throat> You're like the the tenth person to tell me craft had the best catering scene in any production because i had five different people tell me that their favorite catering uh company was always craft well no craft services is what it's called every time you're on a film oh. yeah if you if you arrive at a set you say where's craft where's craft services it's it's just the term for catering oh okay yeah just fyi did uh okay uh, and also, we're going to get to what we said before, the what's next question, and that is, what what's next for Paula Plum? Now, I know you mentioned briefly before, like, what you said earlier, but uh, my show is an open forum. This is the part of the show where you can talk, you can say, you can promote, hype, say anything you want. I am passing the proverbial microphone <laughs> off to you. The floor is yours, Mrs. Paul Plum. <laughs> Um, Mrs. Plum, Professor Plum in the library with a candlestick. Um, <laughs> you can call me Paula. Um, oh, this all of you with this interview, but you know, please call me Paula. Um, I what's coming up is directing, as I said, but I'm also, um, you know, I, I founded a Shakespeare company uh, several years ago, the Actor Shakespeare Project, twenty years ago, with a group of friends, and. Um, I don't know what I'll be doing with them next year, but I will be acting with the Actor Shakespeare Project. Um, I don't have any anything lined up. I've got I've had several film auditions um, in the in the recent past. Uh, two films that I made uh, recently just came out: The Boston Strangler um, with Keira Knightley, and um, I also did a movie called About Fate with um emma roberts who's julia roberts niece um i was really shocked when that movie aired because usually you know i'm a local boston actor okay i'm, I'm hired as a local and you get these parts and this was a great part the crazy aunt right so but they never keep everything you do they kept absolutely everything i did in this movie so it's great to go to a movie and see all of your work up there on the screen. So if you want to see my latest work, go see About Fate. Beautifully said. And let me just say too, like uh, before we conclude, uh, Paula, um, first off, Chris, do you have any final comments or final questions you would like to say, say to Paula or ask? Well, I mean, yeah, I guess uh, uh, that uh, thank you for your contribution for, for the uh, filmmaking industry and your contribution in voice acting. And yeah, uh, you've definitely he, he done some real work in the uh, yeah, like film industry itself. Uh, and I definitely appreciate having the opportunity to have this interview with you. Thank and you. Uh, yeah, I hope the, the projects that you make are, are more than successful. Thank you. What I'm going to say, though, uh, Paula, is that thank you for not only an amazing interview tonight, but thank you for those countless memories you gave me watching Science Court, home movies, Dr. Katz, you uh, growing up. Like, you have this incredible gift where you can make a 33-year-old guy and make him feel like he's back at being nine, being that nine-year-old again watching Science Court or being that 13-year-old again watching home movies. Uh, you've um, You've inspired me to go back and watch all those 
all those shows. Thank you for taking taking me on a trip down my own memory lane. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going to, when this interview is done, like uh, when we finish, I'm going to edit it. I'm going to send you a copy of it. I'm going to post it on my social media page. I'll tag you in it. Like if you're able to like able to send me a friend request, I'll actually, uh, you'll be able to see like the post uh, cool. on Facebook. And if you a have friend, a friend request on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, or if, if you have Instagram too, because I share it on both my social medias. What's your, what's your Instagram? Uh, it's a uh, PD Bowman, uh, PD Bowman. Yeah. P E T E Y. Yes. Okay. Um, find you. Yep. And also, uh, before we go, there's one thing that I feel like you deserve and that is thank you. Thank Paula. you. Paula. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Paula. Paula. Thank, thank you. Paula. Paula. Thank you so much. Uh, Paula, it was such an honor like to have you on and, Again, like Chris said, we wish you the best in, in many of your projects. I know you're going to kick so much ass because you're that much of a great actress and <laughs> one, one, tons of char- tons of full charismatic, like I would, some people call you the charis- charismatic uh, mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I, say, I, charismatic. Say, I can't say charismatic enigma. I think that's copyrighted, so I can't say that. <laughs> charismatic mystery. I'll take it. I was going to say Enigma, but that's already taken by a wrestler. Okay. <laughs> All right. Have a good night, Paula. Thank you. Thank you both, Chris and Peter. It was lovely talking to you. Thank you. Bye. Take care.